Hey, this is Andy Jenkins, and welcome back to my podcast. Today, I'm actually doing something really cool with the Coaches Series here. I'm going to introduce you to my friend, Brian Clay. Now, you've probably recognized that name. You might not be able to quite pin it exactly just yet. You probably recognize it. I guarantee you, you've seen Brian, even though you may not know him. Long before I met Brian, several years ago, I saw a photo of him circulating the internet. It was one where he was draped in an American flag. Really, this incredible sight, because so many times right now, you have athletes that are stingy that uh, really have disregard for the country that gives them the platform to do the thing that they do. Brian's actually going to talk a little bit about that in this podcast and, th- and then we'll move on. But he was draped in the flag fresh off winning the decathlon. Now this was back in the 2008 Olympics. That feat, it officially dubbed him for that four-year Olympic period as the world's greatest athlete. Now, he'd already won. This this is what's cool. Fun fact for you guys that like football or that or about my age that probably watched college football maybe 15, 20 years ago. Uh, Brian had already won on some level that title of greatest athlete because prior to the Olympics, he was tested by Spark. Now, Spark is a rating system across uh, several different sports. It's meant to measure sport-specific athleticism. So the test really grades you on how well they think you'll do. Brian took the football test and hit a score of 130.4. 130.4. That was the highest recorded score ever up to that point. By comparison, Reggie Bush, some of you guys remember him, the famous USC running back, uh, later the Heisman Trophy winner, all of that was scrubbed. Reggie scored a 93.38 compared to Brian's 130. Both of those guys are incredible athletes. Nothing to take away from Reggie. Just kind of putting it all in perspective. So Brian won the silver medal at the 2004 Olympics in Athens. He posted his best score there, but then he returned four years later. He collected the gold in 2008 in Beijing. Now the victory there that margin of 240 points was at that point the best all the way up back to 1972 and he did that by actually besting his score i think in three different events uh three different of the 10 uh, that you have to do for the athletic feat there of winning world's greatest athlete so we talk all about that here's the deal though brian has written a book about winning the gold and how it really was an unlikely path to get there for him, uh, what he had to overcome to go that far. He's talked about athleticism in other venues. There are other podcasts floating around. I wanted Brian to really come in here and talk from a personal level. Uh, I've gotten the opportunity to speak to him not about running, uh, not about throwing, not about shot putting, not about jumping and pole vaulting and all of those things that he's incredible at, and no disrespect to any of that. He is an outstanding athlete. What's more impressive to me, though, is this guy, through all of that, has retained his faith. He is an incredible husband, an amazing father. He is a coach, a business leader, an entrepreneur. He has got his hand in a lot of things. And so I wanted Brian to come on here and really just talk about life and things that he's seen, sensed, felt, and then just how we can apply those. At the end of this, I'll be back with a little bit of an update on a project that we've been doing with ULA, the 1B7 project, and how you can actually get involved with me and probably more excitingly, get involved with Brian in that entire movement. Here's my conversation right here with Olympic gold medalist and friend, Brian Clay. Okay, so I'm here with Brian Clay. Now, most of you guys know Brian is a silver medalist. And here's the thing, there, there's an iconic image of you, Brian, that, that I like, that I've seen. You've sent it to me before, but I already knew it, like when you'd sent it, because it's that one with you kind of draped over. And this one's super important right now because so many athletes seem to, and I guess it's not many, they just seem to be the ones that get the press that are kind of shunning the flag, moving away from that identity. And there's this great picture of you kind of wrapped in the flag after not the silver, but after the gold. Uh, right. um, t- tell me about 
that whole thing because to be the decathlete, you guys are known as really that term, the best athlete in the world is the, the term because as a decathlete, there's not there's not one thing where you say, hey, this guy is the absolute best in this one thing. You kind of look at 10 different things and you are at the top of the game in all 10. So yeah. how do you do that from one set of Olympics, keep it, hold it for four years, come back and do it even better? Well, you know, I think, I mean, the first thing is, is, you know, being able to go and represent your country on a global scale, I, I, you know, it, that's not something that the average American gets to do. I mean, you know, I, I, I look at people like our soldiers, you know, our, our men and women in uniform, and I think about the idea that they get to represent the country and it, and it has a, it, it has meaning to me. I mean, you really do go out and people look and see that flag on your, on your chest or, you know, on your sleeve or wherever it might be, the uniform that you're wearing and they immediately, you know, recognize the country that you're from and what it stands for. Um, and, and there's just something that's, that's, that kind of wells up inside of you, this sense of pride to know, listen, like we represent the United States of America. We're a pretty badass country. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, right. a, it's really cool. We're the best country in the world. This and it's not that we everybody go, wants to come to. Right, exactly, exactly. All over the world, everybody wants to get here except for people that are here. Right, Somehow they want to go somewhere else, right? <laughs> anyway, I interrupted you, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's unbelievable. And so that, that sense of pride, <clears throat> knowing what what your country stands for, knowing that you represent that country, knowing that you're the envy of the world, right? And you get to wear that on your chest. You know, as an Olympian, it's the hardest team to make. The US Olympic team is the hardest team in the world to make. Knowing that you made the hardest team in the world to make, and now you get to represent it. It's just, it's, it's, it's just the coolest feeling you've ever had. I mean, you literally walk out with your chest puffed up and you're like, yeah, we're here and we're gonna handle our business, you know? Um, and then to, um, you know, to, to walk into the opening ceremonies knowing and feeling that way, and then to go on to compete and actually win the gold medal. I, I can remember when I won the silver medal, I, I didn't know that I was gonna feel this way because you know you think you win the silver medal and you're like, oh, this is really cool and everything's gonna be great. And you know I was happy that I had won. It wasn't like I was disappointed, but I can remember standing on the podium and, and when you're on the podium, the second place finisher is just a little bit lower than the, the first place finisher, right? Like, yeah. you know, they're kind of staggered yeah, in height. Staggered um, stare. Yeah. And then you have the, the medal ceremonies. And when you have the medal ceremony, the, the, the flags of the countries of the medal winners are raised, but they're raised in the, the same height kind of staggered order as, yeah. as you are on the podium, right? So, so the flag for the gold medalist is raised just a little higher than the flag for the silver medalist. And the flag for the silver medalist is just a little higher than the flag for the bronze medalist. And, and as that was going on and they began to play, for me, it was the Czech, Repu the Czech national anthem um, from the Czech Republic because that's Roman Sebrele was from the Czech Republic and he's the one who beat me out for the gold and I had the silver. And his flag was raised just a little bit higher than mine and they started to play the Czech national anthem and, and never before in my life did I think it would ever bother me. But as I was standing there, you know, like experiencing all of this and all of a sudden the Czech national anthem starts to play, it kind of hurt a little bit. I was like, ooh, like, I don't know if I like that. You know, like I, I, want, I want to hear the it US. Sounds like you know that you didn't like it. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was really weird, you know. Um, and, and so all of a sudden, uh, I was like, huh, okay, like the next time in my head, I'm thinking the next time it's going to be the U.S. National Anthem, you know. Um, and, and then, of course, I came back in 2008 and I'm on the podium and the U.S. flag is above all the other flags and, and the, the U.S. National Anthem gets played. And, and you realize in that moment that there are billions of people watching around the globe on TV. In Beijing, we had 100,000 people in the stadium and it was full completely sold out watching and listening to your national anthem watching your country's flag looking at you and knowing that you did you know a great job that you were the best in the world at that time 
Um, and the sense of pride and the sense of satisfaction that you feel listening to your national anthem be played and, and watching yeah. your flag uh, be raised. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. And, and, you know, the moment that you were talking about when I was wrapped in the flag, um, I was literally saying a prayer. I, 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 had, I had just won. And when you win, you know, your, your people, the U.S. Uh, coaches and everybody, your, your coaches and stuff, they always have flags ready for you. And so when you win, they, they toss you a flag down and you get to hold up your flag and you kind of get these real iconic shots of you holding the flag, yeah. you know, the track behind you and you've got the U.S. flag out. Um, and I had done all that, but, but I was just kind of overwhelmed in the moment. And I, and I you know, thought to myself, I, like, I, I've just got to say a prayer. And so I got down, I, I was draped in the flag and, and it was over my shoulders and I just squatted down and I, started to, I just started to thank the Lord for the experience, for, for seeing me through. I mean, when people think about all the things that have to go right, if I had walked you through, you know, the four or the eight years of, of kind of focused training and, and the lifetime of training that happened before that, but I'm talking about just the eight years of between those two Olympic games and all the things that have to go right in order for you to stay on path and to actually show up on the given day that they, they determine, you don't determine, they determine it. And, and perform to the best of your ability, not let anything go wrong. The weather can't go wrong. You know, you can't have a headache. You can't get injured. You can't get sick. You, you can't have an asthma attack. You can't cramp up. I mean, nothing can go wrong. All of those things have to go right. They're all out of your control. You know, right. um, it, it's mind blowing to think about all of that stuff and then realize that you were able to capitalize on that and, and win the gold. Well, so on that, a couple of questions on that. It seems like with that, um, you have to be able to control what you can control, but but realize, I mean, there, there are a lot of factors you can't control. I mean, with, with some of these athletes, it's probably truly a matter of what year you were even born and, right. and in terms of when you're going to be able to peak because this thing doesn't come around. It's not like every year. I mean, it, you know, right. it's, I mean, this is every four years. You're going to peak out at some point. Um and so I'm sure there are powerful lessons there because it's, it's not like it was all out of your control. There are things you could not control that definitely weighed in. It were major factors, but then you still have to show up, do all the work, do the workouts, do the running, do the discipline, do the diet, do the nutrition, do the, you know, all the things. I mean, it's just good to hear you say, or like this acknowledgement that so many people don't you go, yes, there are things that I totally did and I crushed it. And there are all these things that, man, they just, sovereignty just lined up on my behalf and i did it does that make sense yeah, yeah absolutely i mean listen you know, there's things that you can control for sure and, and i think you know what i always talk to people about is you know understanding what those things are and making sure that you have a plan to kind of help you along the path to do that but yeah but i think where people get really hung up is on the things that they can't control Right. You know, I remember, you know, I tell people all the time as I'm talking to them, I'm like, listen, I know that there's a saying, it's like, don't sweat the small stuff. And, and I think that that's a, I think that's a good saying. I understand what people are, you know, what they mean when they say that. But for me, I always say, you know, you have to sweat the small stuff because, you know, when I talk about a race, a race is nothing more than putting one step in one foot in front of the other. And that's really what a race is when you break it down to its, its basics. So the question is, how do you do that faster and faster and faster and faster and get to a point where you do that faster than anybody else? It's not by focusing on all the big things. It's by focusing on all the little things, making sure that each step is being put in front of or each foot is being put in front of the other one the right way. Right. Yeah. And, and getting really efficient at the way that you do that. And that only happens by stacking a lot of little steps on top of or a lot of little things on top of each other. And then the result which is what you see at the end, the time that you run or the performance that you have is the result of stacking one little thing on top of the other, right? You just keep stacking these little things on top of each other. So to me, it's like you have to sweat the small stuff because big results come from small things and stacking them and doing them over and over and over again. Um, and so, so while, you know, you look at things like there are big things that you can't control, right? Like you can't control when they tell you that you have to compete. That's completely out of your control. It's not that you don't think about it. It's not that it's not in the back of your mind and you don't prep for it, but you can't control that. You can't control the weather. You can't control sometimes whether or not you have an injury. 
Um, there's a lot of things that are just out of your control. And by focusing on those things, you, you can get distracted. But if you just focus on the little things that you can do each and every day that are on your plan and yeah. you execute on those things, the results take care of themselves. And that's how you, you end up at the end of your, your competition. And you can say, hey, listen, I may not have won, but I did everything I could to try to win that medal. And, and today just wasn't my day, but you're satisfied with the effort that you put in, right? When that's people get, yeah, ahead. when people get unsatisfied, it's usually because they were focused on all this other stuff and it, it was taking their mind and, and they were doing all these other things and they, they didn't actually put in the effort into the things that move the needle for them, into the things that really matter. And so they get to the end of the road and they go, man, I, I probably could have done this better and I could have done this better and I could have done this better. And it's like, well, listen, like if you could have done all those things better, it's no wonder why you didn't win, right? Like, <laughs> right. like you, you yeah. have the right plan, you know? But yeah. when you have the right plan and you just execute and, and you know you did everything you could you walk away going, yeah, it sucks. I wish I would have won, but you know what? I gave it everything I had. I did, I, I did well. And not only that, but I'm a better person now, you know, because of what I, what I went through and everything that I did and all the training and the, the journey that I was on, I'm a better person now than I was when I entered. And so I walk away a winner no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, that's, that's a good perspective right there. Cause yeah, a lot of people do make the excuse of whether it's in marriage, it's in business, it's in, yeah. Uh, parenting, it's, I mean, you just fill in the blank. It's, it's all this. I, I realized that lately I was doing this 75 hard challenge where you've got to do two workouts a day. One is, it, one can be inside, but at least one has to be outside. And yeah. that one was kind of a thing that it didn't trip me up, but it was because I'm still on it and doing it, but it was raining really hard the other day. And so I went outside and I'm like, well, I've already decided, like I'm going on this, you know, I'm doing this five mile run yeah. uh, as the second workout. And it's raining all day. So like, I'm just going to go ahead and do it. It's going to, it's, yeah. it's gonna rain. So coming in, I'm thinking, you know, if I had not been on that challenge and not already made the predetermined decision to do it, I probably would have excused it away out oh, of absolutely. something I could not control the weather. And then I right. started thinking while I'm running, because I, I decided on these runs, I'm not taking the headphones. I'm just thinking, you know, just processing. Right. And I, I was thinking about that. And I was like, you know, the, the weather thing is really strange because if I was going to go see a movie, I couldn't control the weather. I would just walk up, getting wet. If I was going to church, I would just up getting wet. If I was going yep. to, I mean, go get the mail, whatever. It's, I mean, it's really weird how when it comes to certain things, we will let things that we can't control determine mm -hmm. and be the excusing factors on whether or not we achieve it. And at the end of the day, like I just, I just ran through the rain because I'd already yep. decided I'm running, you know? Yep. And you know it's 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 so true. I think perspective is a is a huge is a huge deal. But I think what happens is we just get overwhelmed with all the the little things, right? Like I'm not little things, but you know, like we were saying, all the things that we don't have control over. You you start looking at oh well, it's raining. Oh, that's gonna you know it's gonna be cold. It's gonna be this. It's gonna be that. It's like listen, I you know I tell my wife this all the time. She gets really upset with me, Sarah. She goes, I'm like listen, there's there's a million reasons why you shouldn't do something or why you can't do something. Like we can sit here all day and come up with, you know, excuse after excuse after excuse. And like, just give me one, give me one reason why you should, right? Like give me one reason why you should go and do that and focus on that, right? And if you can just focus on that, then it's like, listen, I should do this because you'll go out and do it. But, but yeah. we, we don't focus on those things. We don't focus on the things that move the needle for us, what put us one step closer to our goal. We focus on the things that, that are blocking us. We focus on all the distractions. And that's what life is, is there to do, right? Like life is there to throw in distractions when you're, when you're trying to get something done. And, and it will never fail. It will always, right. you know, that is one thing you can always count on. Life is going to throw distractions at you. Um, and they're going to try to, it's going to try to knock you off course. But, but you just have to focus on the plan, focus on executing. And if you do that, I promise you, everything else falls into place. It, it, all, it all starts to work out. All right. Take me back to, uh, it was in Athens in 2004. Uh, Roman beat you by how many points? From I think it was like 70 points or something like that. 70. 
So yeah. when you look back, I mean, what, what could have, have you, I mean, I know you've probably done this in your head. Where could you have collected 70 points somewhere in that? Oh, gosh. Okay. I mean, yeah, you can, I mean, I've gone through, it's like, you can, you can pick everything apart, right? It's yeah. like hindsight. You're like, man, if I had, you know, one bar higher in the high jump or, you know, four, three four centimeters you know, further in the long jump or, or, you know, shot put just a little bit. I mean, yeah. you can go through through and you can pick out you know every little area that you um that you could have done better but the bottom line is is like you did what you did you did the best that you yeah. could in the elements in the, the the in the moment in that um, moment yeah and so, yeah and that's that's what the competition is about right it's like yeah you could sit back and look at everything and be like oh i could have done this and i could have done that and i can look at the last four years of training or the previous four years of training and i could just i could say man we could have done this and we could have done this but the bottom line is is you did the best that you could with the information and the 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 you know help and the support that you had you went out and you competed to the best of your ability and for me at the time it was a personal best it was the yeah. best score i had ever had so it was literally the best performance i had ever had in my life I mean, getting a silver medal, while, while I wasn't satisfied with that, I, I couldn't be disappointed, right? Yeah, like he was I had just the better best. that day. Yeah, yeah he, did the best. he was better. Competition. He but, was just better. But when you, you came know, back, and, and you gotta, yeah. so in Beijing, you come back, though, and like going into the final 1,500 meter, you know, the 10th event, right. like you've already got it locked up. All you have to do is finish. So you've got right. like a small 70 point, uh, almost got it to where the last event in Beijing, you don't even have, like, you, ju you just well, have I, to cross I, the finish line. And I, yeah, and I, I know like in your mind to hear you tell the story, there is some debate as to whether or not you were even going to make it. Yeah, I, I can remember I, I was in the Javelin, which is the, the ninth event of 10. Um, and I, and I was having some shoulder issues, torn labor from my shoulder and all this stuff. And so throwing the javelin was really painful. Um, and, and I'd been leading the entire competition. So, so, you know, I knew I was in the lead, especially because they give you a bib number. And at the bottom of the bib, it says leading, right? So they, so everybody, yeah, everybody in the crowd knows, knows who the lead. <laughs> target. Yeah. And, and if that, if if you fall off, you know, they, they come and you switch out that bib and you give the, you give them that bib and then they give you a regular bib and they give a new leading bib to the person that's leading and switch them out, you know, until, until they have, until you're at the last event. And then the person who's leading at the, in the last event will have the leading bib on. And so the crowd can kind of follow. Um, and so I knew I was, I was winning. I didn't know by how much, because we, again, you know, the point totals are something that we can't control. Right. Yeah. I, like, for me, it's, it's, I have to execute every event and it's not even the event, it's execute the technique of every event. And I know the result of that event will take care of itself. And then the result in terms of points and all that stuff will take care of itself. So I don't focus on any of that stuff. All I focus on is executing technique, making sure I'm in the right place at the right time when I need to be there and that my form is all right. Um, and so we get to the javelin. I have no idea how much I'm winning by, but I, I know I'm winning. I take a throw and I walk back and I talk to my coaches and I'm like, listen, like my shoulder's killing me. Like, you know, do I need to take another throw? And they say, well, you know, let's just take another one just to be sure. And I'm just like, crap. Like that, maybe that means I'm not leading by that much, you know? And I know the 1500 meters, it's not my favorite event. And so I don't run that super fast. I'm, I'm not a distance runner. I mean, I can run distance, you know, still, I think I've run 430 in, in the 1500 or the mile basically. So, so I'm not slow, you know, but, <laughs> yeah, but I'm slower. To this product. is thinking 430 for almost a mile right. is, <laughs> but, is but, but I'm slower fast. than a lot of the other guys, <laughs> you know what I mean? So what's the, um, what's and, the fastest guy on the decathlon line? I mean, forget well, the guys that specialize guys that run, in 1500 meters. Yeah, the they would run they would probably run four ten, sub okay. four ten. Some of the guys. I mean, those are those are the really fast guys for us for decathletes. Yeah. Um, a lot of them will run in the four twenties. Uh, that range. That's that's kind of out of my realm. Like I'm not going to run four twenty, right? So, um, so you just kind of know. You know, there's going into the deck. I mean, the fifteen hundred. It's like if if you don't have a big enough lead and and you've got a guy that can run four ten. Yeah, and you're let's just say I'm, four, I'm a 430 guy. 
there's nothing you can do. Like there's nothing I can do about a guy that can run four ten, right? I can just yeah. all I can do is go out and run as fast as I can and yeah, you gotta out throw him and out jump him before you get there. Yeah. You yep, exactly. So so again, so I'm kind of sitting there and I'm going, okay, my shoulder hurts. My coaches have said, you know, let's take one more throw. I'm thinking, oh crap, that means I, I'm not winning by as much as I need to be. So they're looking for some extra points. So I'm kind of like, listen, whatever it takes, like if I if I come down and my my labrum tears even more and I can't, you know, throw like it ends my career. I'm like, like we better go big or go home, right? Like this this could be the last chance I have. Like I may not ever get another opportunity to do this. And so um, so I run down and I just give it everything I've got. I take a throw, it it goes even further. You know, my arm is numb. I kind of walk back with my arm hanging down next to my side, try not to let people know that I'm in pain. And uh, I look at my coaches and I'm like, was that enough? You know, like, what do we, what do we need to do? I don't think I can throw anymore. And, uh, and they're, and they're just like huge smiles on their face. And they're like, Brian, you did it. Like, all you have to do is finish the 1500 meters and you've won. And it was like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I, I sat there and all of a sudden I realized oh my goodness, like, I think I, I may have just done it. Like, I may have just done enough to win the gold medal. Yeah. And, and, and the realization and the weight of, of, okay, you have to finish the 1500 was just in, like, so intense. And the anxiety that all of a sudden comes, because, like, you know, you, you, again, like, that's, a, that's, pro- that's our longest race. You know, it's four minutes, almost five or five minutes of, of running, there's a lot that can happen in that five minutes. You could cramp up. You could, um, you could have an asthma attack. You could, for anything. I mean, anything could happen, right? You, you don't have fall. adrenaline. You don't have adrenaline yeah. working for and, you now. Because all of a sudden, it's like because you know this, you're running on fumes already, right? It's two like fourteen hour days that you're competing. You get like three hours of sleep. I mean, it's just brutal, right? Like they just drag it out over these two days, and. Um, it's almost 11 o'clock at night and, and, you know, all of a sudden you're sitting there and you're, you, you just feel the adrenaline and everything just kind of like, I mean, it's like this literal feeling where you feel it kind of just drain out from your head and it just kind of moves down and it leaves your legs and, and you're just exhausted. And I was sitting on the track on the bench with my head, you know, my head hanging over arms, knees, elbows on my knees. And I, and I have nothing left. I mean, I, there's like spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, I'm just drained. And I'm like, I'm so tired that I'm, I can't even keep my eyes open. Like I'm yawning and I, and I just want to go to sleep. I mean, it was the weirdest feeling. And Roman Seberle, the guy that beat me in the 2008 Olymp- or 2004 Olympics, um, comes up and he's like, Brian, congratulations. And it's kind of thick, you know, Czech accent congratulations like you've done it and 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 I looked at him you know and I'm like Roman I don't think I don't think I can do it and he's like what do you mean and I said I don't think I can finish the 1500 I'm afraid I'm not gonna finish it and he's like oh you'll be fine and I'm like no no no, Roman I don't think you get it like I, I'm serious like I don't know if I'm gonna be able to finish the 1500 and he goes Brian I know exactly where you're at he's like you will be fine and I said, well, I don't know, but I, I need you to pace me. And, you know, I'm like, I told him, I said, I need you to kind of run. He's like, oh, I'm not running because he wasn't competing well. So he wasn't going to run the 1500. And, and I said, no, no, no. I said, I ran when you won. I was like, I need you to run when I win. And so he said, ah, fine. And so he, he, fine. he paced me, you know, first two laps or three laps of the 1500. And then, um, and then I, you know, he kind of let me go on and I ran on and, 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 you know, finished and, and ended up winning the gold. So oh, he did that's it. What he it, was crazy. it was crazy. Yeah. It was that, crazy. Yeah. That's a, that's a great story right there. I don't, I don't think a lot of people know that, that piece of it, that, uh, you know, one year you probably pushed him in. I mean, if y'all were only separated yeah. by 70 points and then the next year, I mean, he literally stepped up to the plate for you to. It was, I mean, we're, we're kind of a brotherhood. I mean, you know, we're a little different. <clears throat> the decathletes are a little different than <clears throat> most of the, um, the other events, you know, there's a pole vaults, another event where they tend to be a little more of a brotherhood, but, but other than that, um, the decathletes are really, 
we understand that the competition that we're having is not against the other person, right? Like the other person is there so that you don't have to compete by yourself, right? But yeah. but really the competition that you're having is 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 against the stopwatch. It's against the measuring tape. That's it. Um, because you don't have to necessarily win the event that you're doing, the individual event that you're doing to win the decathlon. Yeah. What you've got to do is you've got to end up at the end of the day with the most points, you know, tallied and, and then you win. So you can get a second, third, sometimes you can get a fourth or even a last place finish in an event. Um, but if you have enough points in all the other events, you can still win. Um, and so it really is kind of a competition against yourself. And, and, and so often in the decathlon mentally, you know, you're battling yourself. It's not even the other competitors you're sitting there i mean i always tell people after the first event the only thing that's going through my head is if you stop now you'll save yourself a lot of pain <laughs> right it's like it's like in your head you know you have an out like you can quit anytime you want you can fake an injury you can do whatever you want and you can quit anytime you want and you have to knowingly go and take yourself to a place where you know you're you're physically, like I said, and emotionally and mentally, spiritually, where you're completely depleted. You've got nothing left. You have to, you have to take yourself to a place where anxiety is trying to take over and you're constantly in this mental battle of, of no, I'm going to keep going. And everything in your body is telling you to stop. I mean, literally physically, everything in your body, you know, is telling you to stop when you cramp, that's your body telling you, Hey, you should stop back off. You know, when, when something hurts, that's your body telling you, hey, you need to back off. And so literally everything in your body is telling you mentally and, and physically to stop. Like, don't put yourself through this. You know, emotionally, everything in your body is telling you to not take that risk. It's not worth it. Stop. Um, and you have to battle that just every second of the day. Every second you're telling yourself, nope, ignore that, ignore that, ignore that. I'm going to keep going because I know what I need to do. I've been here before. I know that like, you know, I know I'm going to feel this way and you have to ignore it and then give it 110%. And that's, that's not a fun place to be sometimes. I mean, that can be a really, really challenging uh, uh, space to be in. All right. So make the leap for me to the kind of personal, you know, real life now, because <laughs> I mean, you know, no, no athlete can be an athlete forever at some point. I mean, you can right. um, be healthy and, and all of that. But I mean, as far as like a competition athlete, there's a there's an expiration date on that for everybody. Some people expires in junior high, high school, college, you go yeah. pro or if you're a high level amateur as Olympians at some point like that, that's done. Yeah. How do you make the leap now? Because you're in the you're still in the fitness industry. Um, I mean, you, you have a whole franchise of gyms, but also you've got some business things going and you've written some things. And I mean, you've got, you've kind of branched out to this life uh, after Olympian. I mean, you've, you've certainly done the wise thing and leveraged your Olympic background there uh, and that status. But, but, but honestly, you've, you've moved on from that. And you, if the Olympian thing, like if you just erase that chapter right now, like you would still be fine with what you're so how do you, yeah. how do you make that leap how do you make that transition and what, well, what well, it's hard you? right yeah it's really it's really difficult for an athlete i mean you go from you know knowing what you're going to do every single day um and i'm talking about like down to a science right every single day you know exactly what you're going to be doing you know where you're going to be in the world you've got this great support system around you they are all on the same plan i mean and everybody's just forging ahead towards this one specific goal. Um, so you go from that to one morning you wake up in your own bed and you know you didn't have to set an alarm clock. So you kind of wake up at whatever time you want and you're sitting on your couch having your morning coffee and you're looking at your wife and you're going, what should we do today? You know, it's like, <laughs> it's just like the extreme polar opposite of what your life has been for years and years and years leading up to yeah. that point. And it's this, unnerving feeling because you you don't know what to do with yourself you're just kind of like okay wait who am i like what what am i doing right like what am i going to do every day from here on out and and as an athlete you don't think about that when you're training because because you're so focused on the task at hand and so so for me it took me about two years 
to kind of ask myself those questions like who am I what do I want to do what's what's my job going to be you know after my athletic career what makes me happy and feel feel fulfilled um how do I take you know what I've done the last 20 some odd years and 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 bring that into the next 20 30 40 years of my life um and and for a while you know it was like well I could go coach and I was like well I don't want to coach I mean you know that's kind of the the default thing for an athlete would be to just go coach because you know that sport so well right right but I realized I didn't want to coach because I, I didn't want to slave away at the track for you know 60 hours a week and I didn't want to be traveling away from my family um like I had been over the last 20 years you know um I wanted to I wanted to you know, be able to, to have a little more balance in my life. I wanted to be able to, to step up in some of the areas that maybe I was feeling challenged to, but, but because track and field and the Olympics was our family goal, we, we, we paused on some things and shifted and, and, you know, went different directions on some different things. And, and I didn't want to do that. And so, so I thought to myself, well, what am I good at? And, and the only thing I could come up with is I'm really good at track and field. Like that's all I could think about because that's where my head had been for so long. Um, and, and over the two years after going and like doing demo for some friends for construction companies and, and just like coaching a little bit and doing a little bit of personal training and a little bit of this and that, trying to figure out who I was, I started to realize, you know, it's not about what I did. It's about what I learned and the skills and the mindset and the character that I built that allowed me to do what I did well. Right. And, and I started to hone in on those things. And what I realized is if I took those characteristics, if I took those skills um, and I transferred those into whatever it is that I wanted to do, I knew that that I could be successful at that. So if I took my my ability to to the my, my you know, this idea of grit and determination and, and where, you know, you just kind of nothing's going to stop you. If I took that attitude to something, I knew that I could be successful. I knew that if I became a student of, you know, business, that like I became a student of the sport, my sport, I knew that I could learn anything and I could, I could figure it out and make it work. I knew that if I um, took the same ideas around priorities and balance in my life and I, and I shifted that over to business, I knew that I could make it work. And so I started to think about all these different things that I, that I, you know, over the years realized that what I thought was common, um, you know, in, in most people, because I was surrounded by people that thought the same way that I did. So I just assumed that everybody thought that way. Um, I knew that if I took those things and, and, and moved them into whatever I wanted to do next, I could be successful. And so then the next question was, well, what am I passionate about? And, and it was very easy. I was passionate about people. I was passionate about fitness. And so I thought to myself, well, I don't want to work for somebody else. I want to work for myself um, because I want to make my own, you know, um, uh, uh, schedule. I want to be able to, to make my own rules. I'd worked for, you know, I'd run, but I, I, you know, when I say worked, I was sponsored by a lot of different companies, some of the biggest companies in the world. Um, and I just realized that like, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to be able to work with people um, that, that had similar values and morals and, and, and those types of things that I had, because I was tired of working for people that, that didn't fall in line with the same things that I believed. And, and that just made for, you know, tricky kind of, I felt like I was always being pulled and, and trying to be trying to be pulled in a, in a direction that I didn't want to go, um, just morally. So, so I decided I wanted to kind of do my own thing. I wanted to, you know, work with people that, that I, you know, felt like were in the same place as me. Uh, I was passionate about fitness and people. And so I said, oh, well, I should start a fitness company. Maybe I'll start, you know, my own gym. Um, and so I, I kind of, you know, looked around and, and couldn't find anybody in the fitness world that I could trust. Um, it's kind of a shady space sometimes. Um, and I had met lots of people from really big brands that people know out there right now. And, um, and I, I couldn't find anybody. And I finally landed on a friend that I'd met. Um, we were talking about opening a, a big box gym uh, together somewhere else. And um, that didn't work out, but, but I knew he knew about the fitness industry, the business side of fitness. And I knew that I didn't know about that. Um, and so I said, I called him and I said, Hey, would you mind 
uh, looking over this one pager for me that I wrote. Uh, it's a it's an idea that I had, and and you know I didn't ask him if he wanted to be a part of it at first because I didn't want to like overwhelm him and stuff. I was just like, would yeah. you mind looking it over? And I explained it to him and sent him over to him. He's like, Brian, that'll never work. He's like, you know, you're you're going to end up slaving away in the the studio or in the gym, um, just like you would at the track, you know, because he said, you know, the way that you have it set up, he's like, trust me, I know we, we're in this world, we, we get it. And he's like, you're just not going to get what you want out of that um, because, you know, everything hinges on you. Like, you're the only coach. You have to be there. You know, you can only coach, you know, so many people at once, blah, 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 all this stuff. And, and I was like, oh, man, well, that sucks. I guess, you know, it's back to the drawing board. And I thought, well, I'll just do it on my own anyway, and I'll just prove him wrong, right? Because that's, that was, that was how, you know, as an athlete, that's how you that's think. It's exactly like, listen, make it happen. Exactly. yeah, I'm going to make it happen whether you believe I can or not. And then he called me back a few weeks later and he said, listen, I, I've been looking this over. I've been look, you know, thinking about it more. And he's like, talk to my brother and da, 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 da. And he's like, I actually think we can make this work, but, but you've just got to tweak some things in the business model um, so we can think about scale and that sort of thing. And if we can do that, he's like, I think it can work. And I'm like, well, I don't know anything about business. So the, the fitness business. So would you do this with me? He goes, I was going to tell you that the only way I was going to share with you what you should do is if I could do it with you. And so I was like, perfect. That's why I called you. And so, so we connected there. We partnered together. We, we started a company called Eat the Frog Fitness. Um, and we've been growing that ever since. And it's been, it's been absolutely amazing. But, um, but yeah, it was a tricky time as an athlete to try to figure out what comes next. Um, and, 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 you know, through a lot of soul searching and figuring some things out, I was able to, to figure out what I wanted to do. And that was build my own fitness company. So uh, it's, uh, what's the website? I'm going to put the website. I'm going to put a bunch of links down in the show notes where you guys that are listening can find, you know, Brian's website. He's got a link tree set up where you can follow him on Instagram, social media, yep. you connect to Frog Fitness. Yeah, actually, I have, I have all of my, all of my links are on my link tree on, on my Instagram. It's just at Brian Clay. Um, and then the, the actual website for my fitness business is called eat. It's just www.eatthefrogfitness.com. Um, and so they can go there. They can also, like I said, find that on my Instagram and, and kind of do that sort of thing. But, um, but yeah, I mean, listen, it's crazy. It's been a crazy ride. How did you guys come up with the name eat the frog? Yeah. So, uh, eat the frog, uh, is, is based on a, a quote that Mark Twain made famous and, and it's around this idea, you may have heard a couple different versions of it, you know, this idea of if your job is to eat a frog, it's best to do it first thing in the morning. And it's, it's all about attacking the hardest thing of your day and getting that done first thing. Um, not procrastinating, not pushing it off, but, but just getting it done. And so I really loved that because, you know, when you think about a champion mindset. I talked to our team about a champion mindset. When you think about a champion mindset, it's kind of what we were talking about earlier. Um, it's this idea that I, I woke up every single day knowing that my coaches designed my day to try to break me. They were going to throw everything they could at me to take me to the brink of breaking because that's the kind of refinement that it takes to become the best in the world. And and as I, as I got to that point and realized that I could handle that mentally, it made me mentally stronger. And as, as I got to that point and I realized I could handle that physically, it made me physically stronger. Um, and so they were constantly, every single day, pushing me, you know, trying to challenge me to make me better and better and better and better. And it's, and it's that process that, that creates growth, right? Um, and so... This just like I had to do that, what I talk to people about and our team about is you have to have a champion mindset towards life. And what I mean is, is every day you're going to wake up and, and life is going to be designed to throw hurdles in your path. It's going to, it's going to challenge you every single day. Um, it's going to not be easy. Um, and, and you have to take on each and every one of those challenges, each and every one of those hurdles with 110% effort. You can't back off and go, oh, I just don't feel like this today. Or, uh, you know, I'll do it tomorrow or I'm just, I'm sore and I'm tired. And so I don't want to do that today. I'll do it some other time. You can't give it 75%. Like you have to give it 110%, right? And, and I think we go through life. We have a tendency as humans to want to take the, the path of least resistance. It's just, it's just the natural inclination of a, of a, of a human is to, 
to say, you know, that looks really hard. I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna do this because this looks easier, right? It's just every animal in, in, you know, in the world does the same thing. That's why you get game trails, right? Because animals are, they're creatures of habit and they're gonna find the path of least resistance. That's where they're gonna take and, and we're no different. And so it, you really have to wake up every day with, with, the, with the understanding that you're going to buck that system and you're going to say, no, 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 that's not what I want. I'm going to, I'm actually going to take this path over here because I know it's the path to where I want to get. And it's actually going to make me stronger along the way. Um, and that's how you become a champion. That's how you really um, begin to, to start to walk towards success in your life. Um, and so, uh, so we talk about a champion mindset. That's what we mean when we say eat the frog. It's, it's take a champion mindset towards life. And, and one of the first areas and one of the most glaring areas for so many people, not everybody, but for so many people is fitness. That's their frog. That's where, you know, it's the one thing that can have the, one of the greatest positive impacts on their life. But for some reason, it's the one area that we all go, ah, I'll do it later. Ah, I don't feel like doing it. And we come up with all these excuses as to why we want to do it. And what we say is like, listen, start there. Let's just start taking one step towards getting fit, getting healthier, uh, making better decisions there. And I promise you, as you start to do that, you're going to see this, this, this mantra start to bleed into all the other areas of your life. It'll right. bleed into your parenting. It'll bleed into your marriage, you know, as a husband or a wife, it'll bleed into your business. It'll bleed, bleed into work. It'll bleed into all the, your finances. It'll bleed into all these areas. And you'll start to make decisions, not based on what's the easiest path, but you'll start to make decisions based on what is the step that I need to, the one step that I need to take to get one step closer to my goal. Well, that's kind of back where we started with just this whole mentality of controlling the things that you can control and right. realizing there are so many variables that you can't. We tend to yep. blame the things we can't without looking at the things that we can. And that yep. fits when, yeah, you're right. When, when, I'm, when I feel stronger, I, I just kind of carry myself differently. It affects, uh, it, it affects oddly enough, my faith life, it, which you yep. think would be the other way around. And I'm sure it is, but yep. it, it, it affects you know, my faith. It affects how I interact with friends. It affects how I connect, you know, with strangers. It, it's, mm -hmm. it is bizarre when you get that one. Um, I do want to leave people off with, with this is um, there is an opportunity for them to, to kind of settle into that with the 1B7 Google project that we right. have going on where, or you and I are actually working together on that, yeah. um, building a team where, um, fitness is the first of seven F's. And the whole argument there is that life is designed to be lived in balance. And you do need to get your fitness, your finance, your family, the field, which is your career, faith, friends, fun, all of those in alignment. And really, they're kind of like spokes on a wheel. If you've ever ridden a bicycle and lost a spoke, when you lose one, that wheel gets a little wobbly, you lose two, everything might just grind to a halt. And so yeah. All of those areas, every single one of them, it's important to set goals, dreams, vision, to control what you can control in each of those. And, and Ula, our friends have got a new platform there that's digital that does some life coaching that you and I are working together on. And it's, it's crazy that that one, they, they make that same, same argument. They, and they're not yeah. fitness guys. They're in shape, but they're, they've never been fitness yeah. experts like you. But they say, hey, start there. And as you get that win, start moving forward because this, this affects everything. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the reasons why, I mean, first of all, I think the 1B7 kind of ULA project is, is absolutely amazing. I think the framework that they have um, uh, is really something that, that sounds very simple when you look at it from the surface, you're like, oh, that's easy. But, you know, we have a saying in our company, I, I've heard other people say this, um, simple is hard. It's really hard. I, I know that, you know, that doesn't make sense, right? When you think about it. But I promise you, if, if it was easy, then everybody would be everybody doing it. Everybody would be doing right? it. If I, told you, if I told you, hey, listen, you know, there's an easy step for you to get one step closer to being successful at your fitness journey. And you wanted to know what that was. And I said, listen, just set your alarm clock the night before. You're like, well, that's stupid. And yeah, it's like, I'm not doing that. I get it. I get it. But, but I promise you, 99% of the people that are struggling with fitness are not doing that. 
They're right. not setting their alarm clock or or creating a calendar event on their calendar during their free time during the day and, and you know, um, kind of carving out and, and dedicating that specific time uh, for the day the night before. It's kind of like what you said, right? Like you just have to make the decision that this is what you're going to do no matter what. And you have to make that commitment. And 99% and of the people that are not seeing success in fitness aren't doing that one simple step. But if you do that one simple step, guess what? That alarm clock's going to go off at that time. And, and then the most simple step after that is literally all you have to do is sit up in your bed and walk to the shower. That's it. That's the next step. And, and we get so focused on all of the other things, right? Like, oh, but this and this, and I'm going to tired and I stayed up late the night before and all this stuff. And it's like, no, no, I don't care about any of that stuff. I just want you to get up and walk to the shower. That's all you have to do. Because if you get up and walk to the shower, the next step is you're probably going to get out of the shower and then go have a cup of coffee. Right. And, and, and that's, I just want you to get to your coffee. And once you get to your coffee, you're, you're probably more likely, you may sit there for a while, but you're more likely to get up and get in your car, right? And drive to the gym. You know, I mean, it's just one little step after another. And, and what I love about the ULA 1B7 framework is they understand that and they break down everything that you're trying to accomplish, all your big goals, the balance that you're trying to find so that you can have a more fulfilled life. What, what they do is they break that on into daily tasks, little small daily tasks that you can do over a year that are going to help you get to your goal they're going to help you just take that one simple step each day to help you get one step closer and one step closer to to finding that balance and you know people often ask me what was your secret everybody always wants to know what was your secret how did you how did you do it and my answer might be a little different than what you hear on espn and some of these other areas but but, but my answer is, is it was, it was the balance in my life. It was priorities. Um, I, I, I kept my priorities in the proper order. And, and, and that balance allowed me to give 110% of myself to my sport. And so when I talk about my, my values and my kind of priorities, it was always my faith came first, my family came second. And track and everything else came third. And that doesn't make sense to a lot of people because they're like, how did you become the best in the world and have that be third on your priority list? And, and I can go through and I'm not going to tell everybody now, but if they want to know more, like you and I are going to be doing some talks and stuff and people can join our team and, and they can hear us talk and, yeah. and I can inspire people there. But, but it really is about priorities and, and, and the, the satisfaction and the joy that I had winning the gold medal, laying on the track in Beijing, you know, in front of a hundred thousand people and billions of people watching online, knowing that I had accomplished my wildest dreams and, and I didn't lose who I was. I didn't, I didn't uh, uh, sacrifice what I believed. Um, I still had my morals, my values intact. My family was happy. Like that type of satisfaction, that's the satisfaction that, that the guys at ULA and the 1B7 project, that's the type of satisfaction that they're trying to help everybody fight. That's the fulfillment that they want everybody to have. And when I talk to people, the teams that we're building and, and, and the people that I get to interact with, that's the same thing that I want for them. I always say my prayer for you is that you get to experience the moment that I experienced when I was laying on the track, realizing that I had accomplished my wildest dreams and I didn't compromise who I was. You know, yeah. I was... I was, I felt like I was a better person after going through all of that than I was when I came in. And, and there's just no better feeling in the world than that. And so if people want to experience that, if people want to know what that's like, if people just want to help people find that, because maybe they've already achieved that in their life, um, then they should, they should give us a call. They should look us up and they should come join us because I think we're going to do some big things in changing the lives of a lot of people. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I'm really excited to see and hear kind of the testimonies that people have um, once they kind of start down this path. I'm, I'm gonna put a link down in the show notes uh, with that uh, along next to the link tree where you can jump in and join uh, Brian's team there. And we'll be doing some regular Zoom calls where you can jump in and be, be coached yep. by Olympian. And your dream, you know, probably is not, if you're listening to jump on the track, run around Beijing as an Olympic gold <laughs> medal. It's your dream may be to build a business. It may be to learn a new craft. It may be to reignite a marriage it may be to yep. 
uh, some relationship with your kids. It may be to get your faith back on fire. It may be to lose 50 pounds. It may be to write a book. It may be to start something other business, that yeah. you listen to. Yeah, and whatever that is, that's where we want you to get the win and do it by not losing yourself. I, I don't, ideally, living with less stress, walking in balance, walking in your true identity, your true purpose, doing things that really matter the most with the people that matter the most. Um, Brian, yeah. thanks so much for jumping on. Anything you want to say um, before I kind of roll it into the credits? No, I, I, all I would say is like, listen, guys, we, I think we can do some really amazing things here. And, and if anybody's interested in, in like we said, in, in, in jumping on board with us, um, I, I would love to have you. I would love to have you because there's nothing better than feeling like, you know, you've done a good job. I mean, really, I mean, knowing that you've done a good job, that you used your gifts and talents um, to the best of your ability, uh, and that you get to turn around and be an example for your family and your friends of what it looks like, and then take those experiences and help them become better people. Um, there's just nothing better than that. So, so join us. You know, make the decision. You know, take that one step towards a a more fulfilled, more balanced life, and I promise you, you won't regret it. Yeah. All right. Let's end right there. I'm gonna cue the credits cool. right here. So my guess is you probably found several things you could take out of that talk. Let me, let me just kind of highlight what some of them are. You can get them in the show notes. And by the way, I would go to the show notes to get all of the links of the things that Brian and I refer to. Lesson number one, control what you can control. Trust providence for the rest. Lesson number two, do not overlook the small stuff. Okay, the small stuff matters. Three, you are not what you do. You're not an athlete. You aren't the gold medalist. Those are things that are true of you. Those are things you've done. Your identity, even if those things kind of were the moniker for a season, your identity is so much greater than any job, title, role that you carry. Let it all overflow from your identity of who you are. Lesson number four, everything is literally figure outable. Take the lessons of the past, apply them, move forward. Five, your sweet spot is at the intersection, I like this, of your skills and your passions. Those create the opportunity for you. And I would say this, find that passion and purpose. You spend 40 hours a week at work. Let it be something that you love. And as you do it, lesson six, here's the big one. The title of the gym, Eat the Frog First. Do the hard thing. Get up, get in, and get going. Now, in the end of this, Brian and I talked about ULA. ULA is a digital platform that is all about finding balance and growth in the seven key areas of life, fitness, finance, family, faith, fun, filled, friends. We discussed all of that and how you can get involved so that you can live with less stress, live a life that is balanced, live a life that walks into your purpose so that you can do the thing that you are designed to do. The digital framework uniquely bends to you and then it pushes you forward by providing you with curated videos and suggestions specifically for you and where you are. There is also a daily tracker, an app. It marks your progress. It checks daily streaks. It provides built-in accountability and celebration for your progress. I would encourage you right now, there is a 30-day money-back risk-free guarantee, and we are in the middle of the global launch of this thing as a home-based network marketing opportunity. Okay, if some of you know what that is, you know how important that is and what it can mean to be in first. I would encourage you to go join Brian's team right now as an ULA ambassador. We are on the same team. We will both be working with you. Uh, and so there is back end office support. There is support and accountability for you to move forward to your best life. If you don't want to run anything as a business, be a brand ambassador, then you can join as a member with no pressure to do anything except for refine and define your purpose and then live in it. And as Brian mentioned, there are some Zoom calls that we do uniquely just for the team where we kind of set them up, host them, Brian gets there and just shares value with you, just like he shared here today. Okay, let me do this as I do every single week. My prayer for you is that the Lord would bless you, that the Lord would keep you, the Lord would be gracious to you. He would shine his face of favor upon you. May you, as Brian has sensed and felt, May you see an identity that is greater, that is larger, that is bigger than anything 
that you've done in the past that is bigger than anything that you do now. May you feel and realize that from the throne of heaven that you have been chosen, you have been selected or adopted is what the scripture says, and you have been set aside, marked specifically for a purpose that is uniquely you. Grace, peace, I'll see you again soon.